we just don't know what to do. I know for myself, you probably can't see me that clearly, or maybe you can. Maybe you can't tell if this is focused or not, because from where I'm sitting, the camera's way over there with a zoom in to see if it can pick me up this far. Because bluntly, sometimes I just don't feel like it, you know? I don't feel like, oh, moving everything outside when it's cold out or it's rainy or even like today, it's a little sunny, but it's very chilly. Or sometimes you feel kind of down and out and you don't want to say much or do much. Did you know that that's okay too? Did you know that Jesus was silent more often than he spoke? The Bible tells us in Proverbs to let your words be few. And if we chose our words more accurately, reflectively, and thought about them before we spoke them, we would arrange our conversation, as the King James says, in a more articulate way to honor God with the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart in a more pleasing way than the way we discuss things in modern days today. Because inflection and genuflection, a lot of it has to do with how you're choosing your sentences and the way that you present them from your lips to the ears of the person that's hearing them. And that can influence a lot of people in different ways. You can be gentle, you could whisper and bring a person in to pay a little more attention. You can broadcast it a little louder so that you can be obviously heard. You can use stage voice that speaks in a intonated way, but also has the ability to project itself in a large way, a large S. Or you could trust that no matter the words, as long as the heart is caring and daring to seek to communicate, then it will always keep trying to bring across the meaning that the person is trying to speak. And I know on the internet in our day, especially Facebook or Google Plus or a blog or comments, people have a tendency to not read what the words say but to make snap decisions. I read this book. Knee jerk, knee jerk, knee jerk. They instantaneously react rather than stop, think, be conformed into his image so that you would present a proper perspective of who God is in your words as well as in your actions and your deeds, especially on the internet. I know for me in ministry, part of my ministry is to be real. Like days when I just don't feel that good. You know, I, I've had Crohn's disease a long time, so there are days where I go, oh, I don't know, maybe 10 or 12 hours in ministry and then maybe don't sleep so good and the next day it just seems to crash and burn. And, you know, I, everywhere I turn, it seems like, God, 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 help! You know, and... <laughs> He always helps, you know. He has made me this vessel that I am so that in my weaknesses I can use those times where I don't feel like it to touch someone else who else doesn't feel like it, like you. Maybe you don't feel like it too. Here's to you. If you're always on a high, I question whether you're real with your God. I don't see that in the book of Acts, much less in the Gospels. I don't perceive that walking in the Spirit is always one of constant even keel without any interruption of that flow of God. 
but rather I find that there are times of desperate reaching out, of the agony of the soul, of the crying out for the need to meet the living God face to face, to hear the songs in the night, to know the fellowship of his suffering, to realize that sometimes you need to be ministered to instead of ministering towards others. Sometimes we just need to pray or be silent and let God pray. Have you ever done that? Have you ever shut up long enough to let God pray for you? He will. A lot of my prayer is partly from a teaching that I heard at a Calvary one time about an attitude of prayer. And then part of it is from word of knowledge and gift of knowledge that I heard from Chuck at one time. And then another part of it is from this other teaching that I heard that was about the Holy Spirit speaks unutterable words interpreting what we say, presenting it to the Father. And then one time I read about how our prayers are like incense before the Father and Jesus offers them before, you know, his throne as, you know, incense. And I thought, and I talked to God about it once and I said, well, Lord, you know, I, I was studying all these beautiful memorized prayers, you know, that, you know, Jews have. So I, I had my, my, uh, Cedar, I had my prayer book, and so I had uh, already studied the Catholic prayer book, and I thought, well, that was the missile. I thought that was kind of cool, you know. Where'd they get that from? Oh, they got it from Jews. Okay, so I put that one down, and I went over and studied the Jewish one, you know. And where'd they get that from? The rabbis. Oh, okay, so I studied the rabbis. Yeah, I mean, it was just, you know, I always wanted to know where they came from. And when I found out where they came from, sometimes it was like from one guy. Like, he knew what he was doing? <laughs> I don't need to follow that guy. Or like when people say, oh, they're at the school of Gamaliel or the school of Hillel. Can we have the Holy Spirit school? I mean, I don't want to follow somebody. I don't want Gamaliel and I don't want Hillel. I don't necessarily always want Jesus because Jesus said, hey, follow the Father. You know, but yes, I want Jesus because they are one. And, and But my, my point being is that it was always somebody having an idea and running with it and creating something. And every time I found out about that, I thought, well, that's not the source, so what's the source? So there came a time where I realized I don't have to say anything. And God knows my heart. He knows my thoughts. He knows my heart. And if I'm genuine about it, he'll answer those prayers that I think and that I've committed to him without really praying them in some form or format. And he'll take care of it. And the weird thing was, as odd as this was for me, God did. And I went, well, that's weird. Then what's my part in it? You know, and so then I went in this whole, you know, read about prayer thing, you know, about you got to read Murray, you know. So I read everything Murray ever wrote. And then, you know, everyone else and, you know, Weidel and Smith and you name it, Bounds, you know. There isn't anybody I haven't really read, you know, about any subject because I was always curious, whoa, what's his name? And the more I read, I mean, although, I'll be honest with you, it's a little more interesting in the Jewish mysticism side, in the Jewish perspective of a mentality that's a whole lot different than, than Christian, Western, civilized, American Christianity and fundamentalism in the area of prayer, because it's kind of like, hmm, dimensionality and some of the things about what might be going on with prayer is real interesting, but anyway, we'll go there. But... I was always curious about whatever these thoughts were that came into my mind, and so God and I would go on a research project, and you know Jesus would lead me in the way that I should go, and I understood them. And then later, when I found people that were wackos, you know, I mean, boy, <laughs> I knew where they got it from. <laughs> you know <what> I mean, <laughs> they took some things that were opinion and made it into fact, and unfortunately, they didn't read between the lines when they were reading it, like uh, you know, Kabbalism or you know, Kabbalah or the, you know study of it is a sect. <laughs> you know, it's not accurate. It's a offshoot of one man. So come on guys, you know. Follow God. Not man. And you can't go wrong, you'll be in his plan. But such a deal. So in prayer I discovered that when I didn't feel good, 
And there were times when I couldn't say anything because of either, you know, a tube in my nose and it's going down my throat and I was that way for months or because I was just miserable because I didn't feel good. I didn't have to say much to God. God always seemed to understand. He didn't make me daven. He didn't require me to genuflect and bow down. I didn't have to arise three times a day or five or seven like Daniel or an Arab or Muslim. God just heard my heartbeat and took that as my prayer. I guess because of the tender times that I had with him ahead of my inability to pray, that he took my heartbeat as my way to pray. And sometimes I think he knows me better than I know myself. And I like it that way. The unrivaled power of prayer. We know not what we should pray for as we ought to. But the Spirit itself makes his intercession for us with groaning which cannot be uttered. Hmm. Huh. Hmm. Oh. <sighs> <laughs> That's not barking. We realize that we are energized by the Holy Spirit for prayer. We know what it is to pray in the Spirit, but we have yet to discover and realize that the Holy Spirit himself prays in us prayers which cannot be uttered, that we ourselves could not say. When we are born again of God and are indwelt by the Spirit of God, he expresses for us the unutterable. He, the Spirit in you, maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And God searches your heart not to know what your conscious prayers are, but to find out what the prayer of the Holy Spirit is in you. The Spirit of God needs the nature of the believer as a shrine in which to offer his intercession. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus Christ cleanses the temple, he would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. The Spirit of God will not allow you to use your body for your own convenience or to abuse his reconciliation of you to the purposes of God but rather he will cause you to walk in a way that other men might not see or say. Jesus ruthlessly cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and said, my house, shall be called, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of thieves. Have we recognized that our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? If so, we must be careful to keep it undefiled for him. We have to remember that our conscious life, though it is only a tiny bit of our personality, is to be regarded by us as a shrine of the Holy Spirit. He will look after the unconscious part that we know nothing of, but we must see that we guard the conscious part of what we are responsible for. Even as the priest walked into the tabernacle, because in modern days, everybody likes to say, well, you know, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit, so, you know, you need to eat right, sleep right, do right, be right. And they forget that the temple isn't exactly what God designed, but the tabernacle is based upon the design of what is in heaven. And the tabernacle had dead badger skins on the outside. Even as the temple itself had stone cold walls around the outer side of the actual holy ground. Your body, the physical body, is not the temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry. You can decorate it, you can paint it, you can you know, treat it as something special, and it's a dead man <laughs> that needs to be crucified. It's dead badger skins. It's skinned animal that is on the outside of the tabernacle. It's a dead stone wall that should be dead and just committed to mortar on the outside of the holy place of the ground sanctified by the Lord, which is the inside of you, not your flesh and blood. I'm sorry. I didn't hear people say that. I think it's so dumb. I was like, where did you come from? Are you kidding me? Didn't you research it? No. Okay. And what are you decorating? A church steeple? Just like people say, 
It's not the building, it's what goes into the building. Well, it's not you as the temple of the Holy Spirit, it's what's in you that's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Come on! <laughs> you ought to know that. But when you don't feel like it is probably the most opportune time to give God the ability to cause you to feel like it by doing it anyways, whatever it is you think you don't feel like doing. So sometimes when I really don't want to, I don't say much. I just go, Lord, I don't feel like it. And God allows me to not feel like it. But when I start speaking or talking about God, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit, about life, about the Word of God, then my soul flees and flies from this earthly bound entrapment that my present circumstances have it in, and my spirit is set free to worship the Lord in declaring His faithfulness to all that I share and speak in the name of the Lord for His glory's sake. Because if I was doing it for myself, then the words that I spoke and the things that I did would not only not have life for you and me, but that I would feel even worse when I got done than when I begun. But as I do speak and share of my favorite topic, my Lord, who cares, Jesus himself, then I feel the life seep back into me from that union of being connected with God Almighty through his spirit, who causes the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart to be brought into union with God's purpose as he sends forth his word to you, but also to me. To hear so I could feel, and to feel so that I could rest. To be comforted so I would know that I don't have to say anything sometimes. I don't have to do anything. And sometimes that's the greatest faith of all. To not do anything, but to trust in the Lord.